Good morning, and thank you for <laughs> stopping to check out Cincy Lifestyle on a wonderfully sunny day out there. A little crisp, but it's a sunny day out there. We're glad you stopped in. Gee, look at our wardrobe today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mona, good morning. Why are we dressed like this? You know what, Clyde? I'm so comfortable, I can't stand it. Okay, this don't rub so it in. Great. Don't it rub is. it in. <laughs> it is. National Wear Pajamas to Work Day. And I am thrilled to have on my pajamas. I got these for Christmas from my friend Cynthia and my robe today. So I am so comfortable. I'm telling I hope I stay awake during the show. <laughs> I hope you can too, because you got a couple of segments that you're responsible for. <laughs> yeah, I'm in my uh, robe too. I got it from my good friend Amazon.com. And uh, oh. it's it's a winter wardrobe given the temperatures out there. So it's, uh, yeah. I'm, it's really, it's really nice. Good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, we, uh, Mona at least is able to wear all of her pajamas because, uh, you know, we're at home, we're social distancing and that sort That's of stuff. Right. And everybody's right. talking about that. Uh, everybody's cracking jokes. Here's one yep. I found that I really like. It's like number, it was the number two on the list. Number one, I can't tell on TV. But uh, <laughs> the jokester says, you know, they said that a mask and gloves were enough to be uh, to go to the supermarket. They lied. Everyone else had clothes on. But on <laughs> boom. <laughs> That's pretty good. I got to I got to get handed to you. That was a good one, Clyde. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, you, you have a lawyer joke, Mona, I think. Oh, this is not a joke. This is uh, unfortunately a true story, you know. <laughs> We're dressed in our pajamas today, but it's because it's National Wear Your Pajamas to Work Day. That's why. Right. Uh -huh. But a judge, <laughs> a judge in Florida had to remind the attorneys who were doing Zoom hearings that please wear clothes, dress up. He said one male attorney came oh. shirtless, totally shirtless, bare chested, and a female attorney was still oh. in bed with the covers up over her to oh, her neck. Oh, wow. Oh, so wow. He's saying, Please dress appropriately for Zoom hearings. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, there's there are legal briefs, and then there's the <laughs> other kind. And clearly, the judge only wanted legal. That's briefs. right. Hey, is that Allie? <laughs> What's up, guys? Good I too morning. am celebrating National Pajama Day. In my onesie. Good morning. <laughs> what says National Pajama Day like a pink onesie with ducks and bubbles? I love it. I love it. Allie, do you have like two seconds to yes. explain the back of your wall? Because uh, <clears throat> my aunt thinks that you've won gold awards, a uh, gold <laughs> record award. So can you explain it in just a few seconds? <laughs> yes. You know, I like to think I actually, like, that's a Grammy of some sort or some <laughs> swanky award, but um, that's actually a City Beat Cincinnati Entertainment Award. Prior oh. to WCPO, I was producing events for City Beat, and one of the uh, award, or one of the events that we did was an award show for all our local musicians. And so this is the award, or one of the awards that the musicians would get, and then we make one for ourselves at City Beat. Uh, and I just love music, so I had to hang it on my wall. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's just a nice, you know, memory. <laughs> Yeah. And so if I could be a musician, I would be Tom Petty. There you go. I was going to say, and if you're if you're looking in on Skype, it looks like you've got a couple of silver or platinum or gold yeah. albums. That's right. And they're spray painted. It's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Hey, you know, uh, we're dressed in pajamas, which kind of reminds you of breakfast. And if you've seen our show before, you know mm -hmm. how much we love to celebrate national days, especially those that involve food. Well, today we are celebrating a classic breakfast dish, Eggs Benedict. But for many, poaching an egg for this meal, well, that could be a little daunting. So we decided to call in some professional help for you and right now I want to welcome Derek Dos Anjos. He is the chef and general manager at Maplewood Kitchen and Bar where they make excellent poached eggs. <laughs> Derek, thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. So yeah, so I've got a little life hack for you. Okay, all right, because there are a couple of different ways to poach an egg. So uh, tell mm -hmm. us which one you're going to show us this morning. 
Well, uh, this is for the home kitchen. We don't do this at Maplewood, but you use a, a muffin tin mm. and you uh, stick this uh, an egg in here with water, tablespoon of water, stick it in the oven for uh, 15 minutes at 350 degrees. Oh, wow. And just that quick and easy. Yep. And uh, you'll get a perfectly poached egg, um, which here we go. Oh, uh, yes. So Ooh. yeah, it got, has what you want, the, the runny yolk and the, and the stiff whites there. I love a runny yolk. So what are the pros and cons to this method? Well, you don't have to stand over a pot of boiling water and um, you get a perfect egg almost every time. Okay. And you're able to do uh, 12 at a time. So once social distancing is over, <laughs> you can invite your friends. <laughs> Uh, what, what is the other, is there a, a, another more standard way of doing it that everybody tries and that you suggest may be a little too difficult? Well, you have a pot of boiling water. Um, you're going to need um, distilled vinegar, 4%, salt, and you're going to need something to get those eggs out. And what you do is you drop the, the raw egg into the boiling water and sort of uh, swirl the water a little bit like a whirlpool mm -hmm. so you don't get that feathering action in the egg. And then you wait about five minutes and you pull the egg out and you'll get a poached egg like this. Aha. Now, but so that one's the one that's more labor intensive, right? Yes, that'll be more labor intensive and you'll get more of uh, variation in the, in the poached egg. Okay, right quick. When, when you do eggs Benedict uh, uh, at uh, Maplewood Kitchen, what, what, what else do you typically serve with them? Just a few seconds. Well, uh, we serve... Um, on a piece of avocado toast uh, with a nice uh, vinaigrette there. You can see it, the picture just came up, um, and asparagus. Mm, all right, that sounds good. So tell us right quick uh, how people can get access to uh, gift cards or other information from Maplewood Kitchen. Yeah, go to thunderdome.com and um, you can buy a gift card there or you can go to um, 3cdc.org and buy gift cards that also support any of the Thunderdome restaurants and Maplewood. All right, Chef Derek Dos Anjos, thank you so much mm -hmm. for talking to us yeah. and making us hungry this morning. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Mona? Well, pitch, turf, field, whatever you want to call it, having a lawn has been around since suburban expansion. But there was a time where lawns didn't exist. So what was all that space used for? Well, it's all part of another Cincinnati curiosity. With the return of spring, the hum of a thousand lawnmowers resounds among Cincinnati's verdant hills. Our grass-cutting chore has become so routine that we forget Cincinnati once had no lawnmowers and in fact had no lawns of any sort. When the first pioneers arrived in Cincinnati, cutting the grass was not an option. Our hardy ancestors had to cut down a forest worth of trees first. Cleared land was intended for just two purposes, buildings or crops. Any land overgrown with grass was not a lawn, it was a pasture. Grass was food for livestock and fuel for the horses that provided most transportation back then. Horses and cows required a lot of pasture, the equivalent of an acre and a half per animal. So hay and meadow grass were in high demand. Cincinnati achieved some sophistication when the city leaders installed park-like surroundings at the courthouse and at City Hall. Newspapers carried notices whenever these grounds were mowed so citizens could get some free hay for their horses. The lawn mowers back then were humans swinging heavy scythes. Cutting the grass provided a real workout. These long bladed implements are just as dangerous as they appear and injuries, well, they were common. The first true Cincinnati lawns appeared up on the hilltops where the rich people lived. Those folks could hire a crew of scythe wielding laborers to maintain the yard. Some of Cincinnati's larger estates recruited as many as 25 men to mow their greensworks. More often, hilltop landowners turned lawn maintenance over to flocks of sheep or goats. Cincinnati was introduced to mechanical lawn mowers around 1870. These early push mowers required far less exertion than the time-honored scythe. For the next 50 years, push mowers, whether powered by humans or horses, dominated. As early as 1876, newspapers began referring to scythes and other grass-cutting methods as old-fashioned. The new lawn mowers inspired another labor-saving innovation, hiring a young boy to push the darn contraption for you. Gasoline-powered push mowers did not arrive in any numbers until around World War I. 
It took some time for the newfangled internal combustion trimmers to catch on because they were noisy, smelly, leaky, and prone to breakdowns. The state-of-the-art gas mowers were also expensive, and that invited thievery. Almost as soon as gas mowers were advertised in the Cincinnati newspapers, they appeared in the crime reports because thieves found them easy to pilfer, easy to transport, and easy to fence. Anyone for goats? And right now on National Pajama Day, wear your pajamas to the office. We want to welcome the man who curates these curiosities, blogger Greg Hand. Thanks for joining us, Greg. Those don't look like PJs. I, I didn't get the memo on the PJs. <laughs> okay. All right. So right quick, what kind of grass was planted for those early lawns? You know, if you really look at the, uh, the detailed photographs, uh, it reminds me of my own backyard. I've got dogs who prevent grass from growing, and uh, my saying is, if if it's green, I'll mow it. And that's that's pretty much what uh, what these old lawns were like. However, at uh, the official um, city lawns, like around City Hall and the courthouse, they actually planted grass seed. Um, a predecessor of the bluegrass or fescue that we use. And so that was primo fuel for the horses back then. Ah, okay. So you talked about folks getting injured in the process of cutting grass. How safe were the grass cutting tools in the first place? You know, um, I haven't run into many people lately, but I had a couple of uncles who were missing uh, parts of their fingers. Wow. Uh, from, from some of the early, um, early lawn mowers. And if you look in paintings from the Middle Ages uh, of mobs of people coming to burn the witch or storm the castle or that, there's always a bunch of farmers holding these scythes. And they would actually be used as murder weapons. They were very, very dangerous, and accidental injuries were horrific, but they were sometimes seriously used intentionally as murder weapons. Thus the Grim Reaper. Now, uh, you, uh, I, I was just going to say you were talking about a neighbor of yours with a robotic self mower. How's that yes. playing? <laughs> I haven't seen it lately. Uh, when I used to walk the dogs, this thing was kind of a, a, uh, a lawn Roomba. Uh, just bounced <laughs> around, uh, about half a block away. And it, uh, it seemed to be doing a good job. It avoided bushes and it avoided the driveway and that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, but I haven't seen it lately. All right, Greg, right quick, how can people get more of these curiosities? Uh, if you Google Cincinnati Curiosities, you will find the blog. All right, Greg, thanks for joining us. Take care. All right, Mona. He is so much fun. Well, coming up here on Cincy Lifestyle, we explore the Tri-State's curious creatures this time. We'll tell you about the history of those flying pigs, sheep, and squirrels that you can see around Cincinnati. Then, if you're looking for which career, we have good news. There's free, I say free, online training and exploring digital stuff. If you're thinking about changing or starting a new career, then we have good news for you. There's a new free online platform for people to learn the skills they'll need to land those fast growing jobs across fields like cybersecurity, cloud computing, and digital design. And here to tell us more, I wanna welcome Cliff Archie, the Senior Program Manager of Education at IBM Corporate Citizenship. Thanks for talking to us today, Cliff. Thanks for having me, Rhoda. Absolutely. And Cliff, we're going to get right to it. What is IBM Skills and how does it work? Yeah, so IBM Skills is essentially an online directory for anybody who's looking to build technical and professional skills that are going to help them in today's job market, but particularly the job market of the future. We have taken our best of breed content and offered online learning courses, training, um, and some enterprise offerings that were built by IBM as well as educational partners across the globe to really help people anywhere get access to this really relevant training. 
So what technology skills um, are we talking about here? And uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, so you mentioned a couple of them in your introduction. So we're certainly focused on the technical skills that we know are continually changing all jobs. So things like artificial intelligence, design thinking, cybersecurity, cloud, and more. Uh, but we're also focusing through a lot of our offerings on IBM skills, the professional skills that every company, regardless of industry, really care about. So the critical and creative thinking skills that are necessary to adapt to a changing landscape, the collaboration skills, given the fact that even with all, everybody being remote, you still need to be able to understand how to collaborate effectively online. Um, so these are just some of the things that you'll find on IBM skills, and in particular, our open P-Tech platform that is being offered with um, an, an eye towards 14 to 20 year olds that are just starting out their careers. Wow, that sounds fantastic. All right, so tell us about the tools that are available for, for uh, learners and teachers. Yep, so I mentioned Open P-Tech and Open P-Tech is part of IBM Skills and it's our digital learning platform that's totally free to anybody, but is particularly geared towards the introductory technical and professional skills that are gonna be really important for the very near future of work. Um, so these are things that you've mentioned before like cybersecurity, blockchain, cyber, um, we have courses about preparing for your first meaningful work experience, um, giving you the career exposure necessary as a younger person to really understand what it's like to work in an IT field and how technology impacts really any career field and sector. Um, we also have content, as you mentioned, for educators through that Open P Tech platform. Um, we know that teachers have a lot on their plates. They can't necessarily be subject matter experts in the emerging technologies that their students are preparing for. So it's a great opportunity to learn alongside their students um, and also pull from some of the teacher facing resources that we have on the platform. So we have a lot of project based activities that they can leverage to extend the online learning that their students are doing when they All get right. back into schools and actually have the benefit of having students in the classroom. All right, Cliff, this sounds fantastic. Um, where can people go for more information? IBM.com slash skills. All right, Cliff. Hey, they'll be able to take classes online and dress like I'm dressed today in the pajamas. <laughs> so, Cliff, thank you. Yeah, I'm so very much jealous for... of your pajama day. <laughs> Thanks for talking to us today, Cliff. Thanks for having me. Take a look, and you may find some curious creatures hiding across greater Cincinnati. There are squirrels perched on street corners and peeking behind trees. Woolly welcomers outside storefronts ready to greet shoppers, and a smattering of swine saying hello. But what do these creatures mean, and how did they settle on these animals? Well, let's start with the one most people know about, the pigs. As you may know, Cincinnati was a so-called porkopolis due to the fact that it was a huge hub for meatpacking in the 19th century. These pig statues were installed by artworks for something called the Big Pig Gig. During the summers of 2010 and 2012, hundreds of these pigs were on display, but only a handful of them still remain in public view. But you've got to admit they are porkfectly painted. Well, on to our next creature. Black squirrels were brought to Glendale in the 1940s and soon populated that tree-rich environment. To celebrate Glendale's 150th birthday, these hand-painted fiberglass squirrels were placed throughout the town. Finally, on the west side, there's a similar story. In 1818, a Scottish immigrant laid out a village and named it after the hills back in the old country, the Cheviot Hills. And in these hills are a very special animal, the Cheviot sheep. The same animal our Cheviot has adopted as its mascot. To celebrate Cheviot's bicentennial, stone sheep statues were put on display up and down Harrison Avenue. You never know what colorful works of art are hiding around the next corner. So snap a picture the next time you see one of these creative creatures. You learn something new all the time. Well, we'll be back with more Cincy Lifestyle on the other side of the break. Plus, Cincy Lifestyle. Again and again. So subscribe now on youtube.com slash Cincy
Ah, yes, look at the skyline. Quiet out there, but sunny. Uh, that may change a little bit, and it's still a little brisk. Now, coming up tomorrow here on Cincy Lifestyle, we explore the great outdoors through a podcast. Going to hear from one of the nature guys about their podcast and why he believes getting in touch with nature is needed now more than ever. Well, Clyde, then we find out more about a fun activity for the whole family. The owners of Stargazers Pottery, Star Glazers Pottery. Wait, wait, mm. I got to get the pun in there. It's Star Glazers Pottery. Ah, will talk to us yeah. about her take home kits that are sure to be a hit. All that, so much more happening tomorrow right here on Cincy Lifestyle. So, now, uh, so Clyde, you, you've got to change clothes because you're there at the <laughs> office, don't you? It's too bad. And you've got work, other work to do. I'll be staying home oh. in my pajamas and my robe. Yeah, but still working, of course. Uh, yeah, of <laughs> course. Uh, you'll be working on popping popcorn next, right? <laughs> Woo, you read my mind. Uh -huh. <laughs> that sounds really good. You're going to be working right up until 6.30. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's this lifestyle for Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> And remember, we love it when you reach out to us. So look at all the ways you can that are right there on the screen. Anyway, hope you can come Thanks for watching our video. If you liked what you saw, hit that subscribe button. You can also check out full episodes of the show you've never seen before or watch your favorites again and again. And as always, make it a great day.